Okay, so the fundamentals of arresting memory and potential. This is one of these talks that I'm going to try to build a number of concepts together so that you have a good solid understanding of this by the time we're done. Okay, so these are sort of the facts that play a role in what we're going to talk about today. Number one, the membrane is selectively permeable to ions. We laid the foundation, I laid the foundation for that yesterday, right? You know that you have the lipid bilayer that therefore prevents polar molecules, i.e. charged molecules like ions, from passing through the membrane, right? Then we introduced the idea of uh, channel proteins and receptor, or not so much receptors, but channels, facilitated diffusion, pumps, right? So that makes the membrane selectively permeable. Okay, so that's point number one. Point number two, ions carry a charge. That means that they not only interact in, uh, along concentration gradients, but they also interact along electrical gradients, right? You know, just like you learned in middle, middle school, um, minus charges repel, positive charges repel, opposite charges attract, right? Okay. Point number three, the concentration of ions is different inside the cell than it is outside the cell. That was that table of values we looked at yesterday. In particular, sodium and potassium have opposite relationships. Sodium is high outside, but low inside. Potassium opposite, high inside, low outside. Okay, point number three. Point number four is ions diffuse like everything else. Okay, ions are molecules. Molecules will move down their concentration gradient if they can, right? But they are affected by electrical charges as well, like I mentioned a minute ago. And then finally, the fifth point, which really establishes membrane potential, is that moving, movement down the concentration gradient can be stopped or balanced by electrical differences, electrical forces, right? So it goes a little bit something like this. If I have a positive ion that's flowing into a negatively charged space, right? that ion is going to be both attracted by the negativity and by the concentration gradient. So we're going to get very brisk flow there, right? Now, if I flip the situation and I have a positive ion that's diffusing in to a positively charged space, well, at some point, the repulsion of the positive charges are going to balance and stop the diffusion force, okay? <clears throat> All right, so let's look at this idea of the nursed potential. A nursed potential, that's Dr. Nursed. Okay, that's all that means. It's not like a word you've never heard. It's a name. The nursed potential um, is the uh, membrane potential that would exist if only one kind of ion was in play. Okay, so that means that we have a nursed potential for sodium, we have a nursed potential for potassium, and we have a nursed potential for, you know, insert other ion here. The, one we're gonna, the two we're going to talk about are sodium and potassium, okay? Um, now, these points I'm going to cover um, with an attempt at drawing, okay? You're going to find that I am not the world's best drawer, but I think it does help in this case. Okay, first I gotta find the pins. We'll do that one. Slideshow. Okay, so we're gonna talk about, oh, it's still red. <laughs> um, we're gonna talk about the sodium nurse potential. All right, so this is our cell, right? So this is our cell membrane. Membrane. And I'm gonna draw this really big because the concentration is really high outside, right? So we have a very high concentration of sodium inside uh, or outside the cell. Inside the cell, we have a very low concentration of sodium, okay? So what that means is we have a concentration gradient that's going from outside to inside. Sodium is tending towards the inside because of the concentration gradient. 
Now, what about selectively permeable membranes? Well, our cell membranes are permeable to sodium, all right? Now, that permeability is variable because it involves channels that can be opened and closed. But for now, we're gonna keep it simple and say the cell membrane is permeable to sodium. So that means that um, sodium is gonna tend to flow in, right, down its concentration gradient. Each new sodium brings in a new positive, right? So as sodium is flowing down its concentration gradient, the positivity in the cell is going up. See that? Because each time we bring one in, we get a new positive. Well, at some point, we're gonna have oodles and oodles of positives in here, which means that new sodium is gonna be repelled before it comes in, right? So the nursed potential, so the nursed is the um, electrical, it's the amount of positive, so it's the positive that um, exactly balances the diffusion force, okay? That didn't work out quite as well as I wanted, but. All right, so hopefully I covered all that stuff. Let me make sure I did. So sodium, sodium diffuses down, con its concentration gradient carries a positive charge. At some point, yeah, positivity balances. That's the nurse potential. It's a voltage. Okay, so little refresher on physics because I've learned over the years that you all don't remember your physics typically. All right, potential. It's not the same potential that your parents think you have, right? Okay. <laughs> So this is electrical potential. This is what comes out of a, a battery, right? So we measure potential in volts. Voltage is potential. It's electrical difference. How many positives versus how many negatives, that gives you your potential, your voltage difference. So the nursed potential is the voltage across the membrane. Okay, what do I mean by across? In order to have a voltage, you have to have two spots that you're looking at, right? So when we talk about cells, the two spots we're looking at are the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell, right? So we take our little probes, one goes in, one goes out. We measure the electrical difference between them. That's the potential, okay? So the nursed potential is a specific voltage where the diffusion forces are balanced by the electrical forces. Okay, so that's the nurse potential. For, and then nurse always has a four. Nurse potential for sodium is the voltage at which sodium stops moving in because the positivity is high enough, right? All right. Okay, so for sodium, the nurse potential is about plus 61. Now, I'll tell you, in physiology, every time you see a number like that, anywhere you look, it's gonna be a little different. <laughs> okay, so what that means is, I'm not gonna ask you to know specific numbers, all right? Ranges, yes. So the nurse potential is positive, number one, and it's between 60 and 90, okay? So for our purposes today, we're gonna to say plus 61. All right, so what does the sign say? The sign tells you what kind of charge is on the inside of the membrane. All right, so if it's a positive uh, measure, if it's a positive um, nurse potential, it means that the inside of the cell tends to be positive as opposed to a negative nurse potential where the inside of the cell would tend to be negative. All right, so if the inside of the cell is positive, and sodium's concentration gradient is from outside in, well, there's our repulsion factor, right? We have positive repelling positive. So it's the, this is the potential where you get that balancing act. Now, let's switch over to potassium. Potassium situation is different because it's high inside the cell and low outside the cell. So here we have the situation where potassium, if we open a channel on the membrane, potassium is gonna to tend to leak out, right? 
So what will stop it? Well, the nurse potential for uh, potassium is very, very negative, negative 94. Again, a range minus 70 to minus 90, okay? 94 is maybe a little on the high side, but that comes from your book, okay? So the nurse potential for potassium is negative. That means that when potassium stops moving due to concentration, right, the inside of the cell is negative. Now, why is that? Well, potassium is trying to leave the cell. Negatives attract positives. So at some point, the inside of the cell is so negative that it's holding on to that positive charge and won't let it leave by diffusion, see? So that's the nurse potential for potassium, right? So here we have big potassium inside, little potassium outside, right? So potassium is going to tend to go out. Well, as it goes out, each time it leaves, we get a positive out here and a, and a relative negative on the inside. Well, if enough of these leave, we're going to have um, potassium will stop leaving because the negative is attracting it. See that? So <clears throat> when we have a potassium or a concentration gradient that goes from the inside out, we end up with a nurse potential that's profoundly negative. Okay, now is where it gets a little more complicated because we have both sodium and potassium in play all the time. Okay, so how does that work when you have more than one molecule? Well, they, they do not balance each other out. Instead, both nurse potentials are in play all the time. And what we see in the cell is somewhere in between the nurse potential for sodium and the nurse potential for potassium. The other thing that happens here is, remember, we have selective permeability. So we can open sodium channels or close them or open potassium channels or close them. So it means that the, the membrane potential at any given time is going to be determined by how much potassium is permeable and how much sodium is permeable. So it establishes the base uh, electrical difference that will let us have an action potential, which we'll talk more about, like I said, next week. Okay, so let's talk through my pictures here. Um, <clears throat> and you'll notice not all my pictures come from your book. It's because whenever I find a good picture, I hold on to it and put it <laughs> in my slides because I think it's useful. All right, so what we have here, this is our cell membrane, all right, inside of the cell, outside of the cell. Here's our handy dandy voltmeter, right? So as I told you, You've got a probe on the outside and a probe on the inside. Can you really do this? Yes, you can. There are teeny tiny little probes and you can stick them in there and this work has been done. So like this is experimentally valid. All right, so we have our resting membrane potential in this case of minus 70, all right? Um, so that is the balance of potassium's diffusion gradient and its electrical gradient, right? So we have the balance of charges minus 70. Um, <clears throat> and then, okay, so this is in the typical case. You'll notice minus 70 is not minus 90. Why is that? Because the cell isn't completely freely permeable to potassium. There are only so many potassium channels on the membrane. And we talked about saturability, right? That um, more, more potassium can't flow out without more channels to flow out of, see? Um, so the minus 70 is what we find experimentally because we have only so many potassium channels. If we, in, if we replaced this channel system with a membrane that was simply permeable to potassium, then we would get our minus 90 like we were talking about, right? So the minus 70 comes from um, the uh, limitation of the number of channels we have. Okay, so now let's look down here at sodium. Um, let's do the freely permeable one because that's what we were just talking about. So here, if sodium was freely permeable, we would have an equilibrium potential or nursed potential of plus 66. See what I mean about how the numbers are different in every book, right? Um, <clears throat> but plus 66. 
Well, what do we get in reality? Well, in reality, we get, um, again, about a minus 70 because of the limitation on how much sodium can enter the cell. All right, a little more on that later. All right, so if we put all this together, because in a real cell, right, we have potassium channels, sodium channels, potassium gradients, sodium gradients, and electrical gradients. Wow, that's a lot of gradients, okay? <clears throat> well, here are our players. Here's our meter, okay? So we're gonna measure our membrane potential. Um, here is a potassium channel. So we see that potassium is having a tendency to diffuse out down its concentration gradient. Here's a sodium channel. Sodium is, uh, tend tends to um, diffuse in down its concentration gradient. And then the last bit that we have is the sodium potassium pump. Okay, so how does the sodium potassium pump matter here? Our cells are leaky to both potassium and sodium. Okay, so potassium is always leaking out a little bit. Sodium is always leaking in a little bit. That is not what the cell wants, right? The cell needs to have low sodium inside, high potassium inside. So in comes the sodium potassium pump, which does just that. It pumps out sodium and it pumps in potassium. That is opposite the concentration gradients, see? So that's why we call it a pump, because it uses ATP to push molecules up their concentration gradient. So you have to use energy for that, okay? Putting all this together in real cells with the sodium potassium pump, leaky potassium channels, leaky sodium channels, we end up with a resting membrane potential of about minus 70, okay? Now that number, worth knowing, right? Minus 70, resting membrane potential for cells in general. Now, neuronal cells have a little bit of a lower resting membrane potential, minus 90. Um, uh, there are, and, and we'll see a couple of other rare exceptions, but generally minus 70 you can assume is a resting membrane potential. Um, now, also recall that, you know, where's the negativity? You know, it, we are not talking about any anions here. We're only talking about cations. So the negativity that results in negative charge on the inside of the membrane is mostly the result of negatively charged proteins. So in the extracellular space, it's chloride that carries the negative charge. In the intracellular space, it's primarily proteins that carry the negative charge. Now, can proteins leave the membrane? Not very easily, right? They have to be secreted, because remember, proteins are great big, huge things. So they can't just leak out. So the negativity is kind of trapped on the inside. Um, and that helps to stabilize the membrane potential at minus 70. All right. Um, <clears throat> so the resting membrane potential combines the sodium and potassium um, effects. So, you know, our nurse potential for sodium is positive, our nurse potential for potassium is negative, and if we combine those two together um, in real life, we end up with that minus 70, or this is a nerve cell, so we see minus 86 in this case. Okay, so I have another one of my movies, right, that kind of shows this in picture form. Can you turn my lights off for me? And it better play. Yay. The human brain alone contains about 100 billion nerve cells called neurons. A neuron, like every other cell, has positively and negatively charged ions inside and outside. Further, a resting neuron has a greater negative charge on the inside surface of the plasma membrane and a greater positive charge on the outside surface. This partitioning of charge creates a voltage difference across the membrane known as the resting membrane potential, which can be measured using a voltmeter. On average, an intracellular electrode records a value of minus 70 millivolts. The resting membrane potential depends on two factors. First, 
It depends on the presence of sodium and potassium gradients across the plasma membrane. Specifically, there are more sodium ions outside the neuron than inside, and more potassium ions inside the neuron than outside. Second, the resting membrane potential depends on the differential permeability of the plasma membrane to sodium and potassium ions. Leak channels in the plasma membrane allow sodium and potassium ions to diffuse or leak down their concentration gradients. The membrane contains many more potassium leak channels than sodium leak channels. Thus, the membrane is much more permeable, or leaky, to potassium ions. As positively charged potassium ions leak out of the neuron, the inside surface of the membrane becomes negatively charged compared to the outside surface. If potassium was the only ion moving, the potential would stabilize at minus 90 millivolts. However, positively charged sodium ions leak into the neuron, which slightly offsets the negative charge and raises the voltmeter reading to minus 70 millivolts. Sodium potassium pumps actively transport sodium ions out of the neuron and potassium ions back in, compensating for the sodium and potassium leaks. Thus, the pumps help to maintain the resting membrane potential. All right, you can turn my two side lights back on if you want. Thank you. How, why did I do that? Because I'm ready to go diving, that's why. <laughs> if, honest, if honesty is going to prevail. Okay. Spent all, yes, all last night getting my stuff all ready. Okay. <clears throat> um, so we have potassium and sodium. They're both happening at the same time. Uh, I think we talked about that. All right. The other piece that I need to share with you is at a resting membrane potential of minus 70, all right, which molecule is ready to move? Okay, so the nurse potential for potassium is minus 90. The, the nurse potential for sodium is plus 66. We're at minus 70. So if I open a potassium channel, potassium is not at its nurse potential, right? So it can move. It's going to go down its concentration gradient. Sodium, if I open a sodium channel, well, minus 70 is really far away from plus 66, right? So that means when I open a sodium channel, sodium is not only going to come in, it's going to come in in a flood, right? Because it's, it's falling down its concentration gradient and it's being attracted by the electrical negativity inside the cell. So that fact, because they're both ready to move, sodium more so than potassium, you know, in an action potential, an action potential is just a way for a cell to convey information very quickly from one side of it to the other, right? Well, what's the quickest way we can do that? You know, we don't want it to take two seconds because you're never going to catch a ball going 40 miles an hour if it takes you two seconds to, to have a neural connection, okay? So we need it to be fast. Well, <clears throat> the action potential can be very fast because neither sodium or potassium is at equilibrium. So when you open channels, the sodium comes rushing in. When you open a potassium channel, potassium goes rushing out. Everything happens really fast. Okay, so <clears throat> if these channels need to open and close to make things happen, how does that happen? Well, both potassium and sodium channels have gates. And these gates can be opened or closed in response to a wide variety of factors, depending on how the channel um, evolved, right? So voltage may cause a channel to open. Chemical may ch cause a channel to open, even mechanical change, as I have in pictures here. <clears throat> so here's our uh, sodium or potassium channel, right? Here it's closed. This is an example of um, a chemically gated or a receptor type channel. So it's closed, nothing happening. Acetylcholine, let's say we're at the neuromuscular junction where nervous system meets muscular system, right? The nervous system is going to give a signal for a muscle to contract. Well, acetylcholine binds to this receptor. That causes the receptor to open. 
and then sodium comes rushing in down its concentration gradient and down its electrical gradient, right? Now, the interesting thing is because sodium carries a charge, as the, so as the sodium comes rushing into the cell, which is negative on the inside, the cell becomes less and less negative, right? Because each time a sodium comes in, it's bringing a positive charge with it. So when we open a channel, we see the membrane potential change, right? And that then becomes the action potential, which we will get into next week. So that is a chemically gated channel. Um, here we have a voltage gated channel. These are fundamental in the action potential, these voltage gated channels. The way they work, they open and close in response to membrane potential, right? So these are proteins that can actually detect a change in electronegativity between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. So, for example, when um, the cell is at rest at minus 70, the gate is closed. If, however, we drop the membrane potential, or rather increase the membrane potential, to minus 60, then this channel opens. Well, how might we do that? How might we go from minus 70 to minus 60? Well, this would do it, wouldn't it? Right, because when we have positives coming in, that minus 70 is gonna become minus 69, minus 68, minus 67, until it gets to minus 60. Then at minus 60, the channel opens, and now even more sodium can come rushing in. See how that works? So to put this in context, well, not that kind of context. Come back here. To put this in context, let's say this is a neurotransmitter, right? Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, okay? So you're at a, the end of a nurse, nerve cell. Neurotransmitter opens a chemically gated channel, causes some sodium to come in. Well, that sodium coming in then triggers the opening of more channels that are now voltage gated. Now oodles and oodles of sodium are coming rushing in. As they do, the membrane potential gets higher and higher and higher. Well, the cell does have kind of an off switch for this. At plus 30, this sodium channel, the other gate closes and it becomes inactivated. It stops getting more positive right? Now the sodium potassium pump eventually will put this back to minus 70 and now we're ready for this change to happen again. In an action potential, this pattern is happening in each segment of the neuron in a progressive fashion, essentially changing the membrane potential from one end of the cell all the way to the other end so that at the other end something can happen as a result of that change. So this is very nervous system oriented. Well, now let's talk a little bit about sensation. <clears throat> you know, how do we detect the fly that lands on our skin, right? Well, one of the ways we do it is that last row where we have a mechanically gated channel. Here, if something deforms the membrane of the cell, that channel opens a little, right? allows sodium to come in. When sodium comes in, that's going to elevate the membrane potential, okay, like we saw up there. We call that depolarization, all right? When the membrane potential starts to go up towards zero, depolarization. That depolarization then triggers the opening of um, voltage-gated channels, and we get a big membrane potential change. We're up to plus, plus 30 in no time, see? So these changes in membrane potential really explain how the body responds to the external environment as well. Which is one of the re yeah, get your Kahoot out. Which is one of the reasons I start with this. I start with membrane potential and action potential because it's the primary way that the body conveys information from one place to another place, right? How does the membrane build up a charge is essentially what membrane potential is. Now, why is that important? Because charge can move across the membrane of a cell 
and therefore send a signal that that cell has been activated, right? So that's what we're going to build into today is we're going to build up to the action potential, which I'm sure you all uh, uh, are familiar with from your past classes. But before we get there, okay, we have to get some vocabulary down. Um, graded potentials, that phrase, uh, a synonym for it is a local potential. This is a regional change in the membrane potential. All right, so everything we've talked about so far about membrane potential has been looking at just one little tiny area of the cell, okay? So now we have to sort of zoom out and consider that we have, we're gonna make our cell yay big, right? So we got a big cell. We've only been looking at one little spot of it. That is what we call a local potential. So uh, an act, the activation of a receptor, for example, in an area of the cell membrane will cause a region of the cell to depolarize, right? To have a membrane potential change. Well, if we have enough of that signal, the one little region will expand to include the whole cell, okay? So that's where we're gonna get to. So graded potential or local potential is a regional change in the membrane potential. Now, a uh, synonym for membrane potential is transmembrane potential. Because remember, when we measure electrical potential, we have to have two spots, right? So what we're measuring with potential is always across a distance, the, pot the potential across a distance. And in this case, we always have one probe on the outside and one probe on the inside, so the voltage difference is across the membrane, i.e. transmembrane potential, right? So you'll hear that term as well. Okay, so any shift in the membrane potential from um, towards the positive, in other words, if we go from uh, low, sorry, if we go, yeah, if we go from very low to high, we call that depolarization. Movement in the positive direction is how I think of it, okay? So that might be going from plus 10 to plus 50, or it might be going from minus 90 to minus 60, right? Still, movement in the plus direction is depolarization. Movement in the negative direction, we call hyperpolarization. So that's minus 60 to minus 90, for example, is a hyperpolarization. Now, we use the term repolarization to talk about the membrane going back to its resting membrane potential. Okay, so for example, at the end of an action potential, we have a cell that's sitting at plus 30. Well, it needs to get back to its resting potential of minus 70. So the process by which that happens, we call repolarization, all right? So depolarization, hyperpolarization, repolarization. We're gonna talk about those three words quite a bit in the next couple of weeks, okay? So be sure that you um, have got that down. Now, all of these changes in membrane potential um, are gonna occur for some reason. Now, that's, that reason may be a gated channel. It might be a voltage-mediated uh, channel. Here, let's go back to my list. Um, these are three examples, right? We have a receptor-gated channel at the top, a um, membrane uh, deformation channel at the bottom, and then we have a voltage-gated channel in the middle. We talk most about the voltage-gated channels because they play the biggest role in the action potential. But the um, uh, receptor-mediated channels are what get things going in the first place, as I think you'll see here in a little bit. All right, so um, <clears throat> to look at the pictures here, so here's our resting membrane potential. In, the, in this case, this cell is minus 70, okay? And we talked on Friday about how we arrive at that, the balance of sodium and potassium's leakiness versus their electrical gradients, right? Okay, so now we're gonna uh, enter a little acetylcholine on this ligand or receptor-gated channel, and we see that when we open this channel, a bunch of sodium goes rushing in, right? That's gonna elevate 
the membrane potential a little bit. So we have a small depolarization, see? Now, this continues, right? More sodium goes in, and that causes the membrane to potential to become even more depolarized, even more towards zero in the positive direction. Now, at some point, as we'll see in a minute, there will be enough membrane potential change to start opening those voltage-gated channels that we've already talked about, right? Once that happens, then we're going to have the potential for an action potential. Okay. So if we take our nerve cell in this case, and we sort of zoom out and look at it, at least in 2D, okay? So here is the axon of a neuron. Here is another axon of a neuron, right? You remember from your past biology classes that neurons release neurotransmitters, right? Those neurotransmitters um, bind to proteins very similar to what we see here and cause channel proteins to open. Well, when a channel protein opens, so if it's a sodium channel, for example, sodium's gonna come rushing in, we'll get a membrane potential change in that area where the receptor is, right? So in my picture, the red zone is the area of depolarization as a result of this axon releasing neurotransmitter, right? So that's neuron number one. Well, we've got neuron number two, is in a, a similar close region, so there's an overlap in the membrane potential change, right? Because we have two neurons both affecting the same spot. Okay, now enter this region right here. The beginning of the axon, okay, this axon would continue long and long, right? The area just in front of the axon is, a, is called the axon hillock. And the axon hillock is a place that has a lot of voltage-gated channels. So what that means is if we get a large change in membrane potential in this region, the cell is going to have a tendency to transmit an action potential, right? Which we're going to see that more in a minute. Okay, so if we zoom in on just one of these neurons, okay, what we see is that the response to the chemical stimulus, in other words, the neurotransmitter being released, is a depolarization. Now, let's say just one neuron was activated. Well, we would get a depolarization and then a repolarization and then it would go back to normal, right? Nothing much happened, there was no action potential. We only get an action potential if we get enough stimulation from enough other neurons to bring the whole cell to threshold. Now, another thing I want to point out is not all neurotransmitters are stimulatory. In other words, some neurotransmitters don't cause depolarization, they cause hyperpolarization. And based on what we talked about yesterday, what would be the ion channel? What kind of ion would cause hyperpolarization? Potassium, right? Because when we open potassium channels, positivity goes rushing out of the cell, right? So the inside of the cell becomes more negative. So generally speaking, depolarizing influences are on the sodium side. Hyperpolarizing influences are on the potassium side. To translate that into different words, stimulation, sodium, inhibition, potassium, right? Now, our neural systems are far more complicated than we ever talk about in our classes. And the reason for that is it just gets, it, it gets crazy complicated. Each neuron can have a thousand or 10,000 connections to other neurons. So what an individual neuron does is the sum of all the stimulation and all the inhibition and whether or not that turns that neuron on or off, right? So stimulation, depolarization, inhibition, hyperpolarization. All right, so we have uh, an, a synonym for stimulatory is excitatory. So we have inhibitory, that's hyperpolarization, or stimulatory, excitatory, that's uh, depolarization. Okay, so the whole point of the last day and a half of talking was to get us to the action potential. What the heck is an action potential? Essentially, it's a change in membrane potential that is propagated 
from one part of the cell to another part of the cell. Now, typically when we talk about action potential, we're talking about neurons. And the area of the cell that we're looking at is the axon. The axon transmits the action potential from the beginning all the way to the end. Now, a couple of things to remember, remember about neurons. They either fire or they don't. There is no half fired, right? So a neuron, it, it either is stimulated to have an action potential or it is not. There's no other thing it can do. So the way that a neuron transmits analog information, in other words, there's more or less of a something, is in frequency. So a neuron that fires fast is saying a lot is happening. A neuron that's firing slowly is saying something's happening, but not very much, right? Okay. So action potential is this con conduction of membrane potential change from one area to the other. Now, the other place that we see this play a role is in muscle cells, and we're going to start in on that um, tomorrow. We're going to talk about muscle physiology beginning tomorrow. Okay? So the action potential is created by neurotransmitters opening channels. Right? That's the graded potential like we just talked about here. It is propagated by voltage-gated channels, channels that open and close in response to membrane potential change. Okay? So the voltage-gated channels that we speak of are sodium and potassium. The sodium channel is a little more complex than the potassium channel is because the sodium channel has two gates an activation gate and an inactivation gate. All right, the potassium um, voltage gated channel only has an activation gate. Okay, <clears throat> so the activation gate, the one at the top, opens very quickly, like much less than a millisecond, very, very fast. And it opens when the membrane potential becomes significantly less negative. In other words, when there has been a depolarizing event, the sodium channel activation gate opens. Now, what happens next, you can guess. When the sodium channel opens, sodium comes rushing in. It's going to bring its positivity into the cell, and it's going to cause that cell to fuller, more fully depolarize, right? Um, so that causes a depolarization. We actually go from, in this case, our resting is minus 90, okay? Sodium comes rushing in, and eventually we end up all the way at plus 35. Now, what about the inactivation gate? The inactivation gate works on a kind of delay, all right? The activation gate opens real fast when the deep membrane depolarizes. At the same time that the activation gate opens, the inactivation gate starts to close but it's pokey about it, right? It slowly closes. So it means that the inactivation gate of the sodium channel um, closes at about the same time that the potassium activation gate opens. Okay, more on that in a minute. All right, so we have activation opens first, then inactivation closes later. Now I do want you to know that the stimulus for both gates is the same, and that is the change in membrane potential, the, the membrane depolarization. In other words, we went from minus 90 to, say, minus 70. That small depolarization was enough to trigger both gates. Activation opens fast, inactivation closes slowly. All right. Now, the potassium gate, it responds to the same depolarization event that the sodium gate responded to. But just like the inactivation gate on the sodium, the potassium channel opens slowly. It doesn't click open like the sodium gate does. It kind of opens over some time, right? So the potassium, the bold's important here, the potassium channel opens at about the same time that the sodium channel through the inactivation gate closes. All right. There's more on this here in a minute. So we're, we're still building. I thought I had. <clears throat>
Yeah, that's where we're, we're coming to that. Okay. So different pictures from a different book. So the numbers change, but the pattern is the same. All right. So here we have our cell at rest. Minus 70 millivolts just hanging around doing nothing. The sodium activation gate is closed. The inactivation gate is open. The potassium activation gate's closed. So everything is kind of status quo, right? Now, we have a neurotransmitter that's released. We have an area of membrane that becomes depolarized. When we get to the threshold of the cell, that depolarization causes the sodium gate to activate. This depolarization is also going to trigger the closure of the inactivation gate and the opening of the potassium gate. But those happen later, right? There's a delay on that. Okay, so we open the sodium gate. Sodium comes rushing in. Now we see a big membrane potential change because we're getting a lot of positivity rushing into the cell. All right, so now we go down here. Next step, the inactivation gate of sodium is closing. The potassium gate is opening. Why? Same stimulus is up here, right? But a delay, there's a delay on it. So now what we have is sodium gates are closed, potassium gates are open. So what will that do to our membrane potential? Well, potassium is going to go rushing out, right? And it's going to bring positivity with it, which is going to drop the membrane potential from plus 30 all the way down to minus 90, very close to the nurse potential for potassium. All right, so we get a big change in membrane potential. Then eventually that potassium gate closes and the cell, the sodium potassium pump moves sodium out, potassium in until the resting membrane potential is restored again. All right, so these are the steps that are happening during an action potential at a particular area of cell membrane. All right, okay, so we have <clears throat> conductance is just a fancy word for permeability. When we talk about sodium channels opening, okay, what we're really talking about is the membrane becomes more permeable to sodium when sodium channels are open. I think that makes sense, right? So the more a thing passes through the membrane, the higher its conductance or how it is conducted across the membrane. All right, so in our graph here, this is membrane potential. Okay, so our cell is going to go from minus 90 to plus 10 back to minus 90. All right. Now the graphs up here are showing you what is moving around. In other words, what is passing through the membrane. So we see when we go from minus 90, we'll have some, uh, you know, stimulus that causes a small depolarization. That's going to activate the sodium gates. So we see that first the conductance of sodium goes way up, right? And then it goes way down. So activation is quick. Do you see how um, this line is almost straight up? So the activation happens real fast. The inactivation happens slowly over time <coughs> with the sodium gate. Now in the potassium channel, we see similar pattern, but the timing's different. Right, so we get our depolarization event right here. That causes the potassium channel to slowly open. What, by the time the potassium channel is open, the sodium channel is just about closed. See that? So at the time that sodium conductance is decreasing, potassium conductance is increasing, okay? And we see that in the membrane potential. We go from minus 90 all the way up to plus 10. And then as potassium starts to dominate uh, the conductance, we see that the, the membrane potential goes back down to minus 90. So <clears throat> this is an example of a positive feedback system. You probably remember from a and that there's negative feedback like a thermostat right? That's the classic example. Like, you know, when it gets too warm, your air conditioner comes on, cools the house, right? This is an example of a positive feedback mechanism. So a positive feedback mechanism is where a small change makes a big change, right? So another example that we'll talk about at the end of the course is childbirth is another positive feedback mechanism. 
a small change makes a big change, makes a lot of things happen. So a, an action potential is the same kind of thing. The small change here is the depolarizing event that causes the activation of the sodium gate in the first place, right? Which is usually a neurotransmitter affecting a sodium channel, right? Then that small event becomes the big event, which is the action potential. The whole cell gets excited enough to send its uh, action potential all the way down that axon. All right, so if we take our little meter and we put it across the cell membrane at a particular place, when an action potential passes that place, this is what we see, right? So here we are at resting membrane potential. When the membrane potential goes up to threshold, which in this case we're calling minus 60, that's going to trigger the opening of sodium channels, right? So the upstroke at two is the result of sodium rushing in, carrying sodium with it into the cell and therefore causing depolarization, a change towards the positive. At point number three, sodium channels are closing, inactivating, right? Potassium channels, now that slow activation gate is finally open. So from three to four, what we see is potassium rushing out. So we see uh, the membrane potential go from sodium's nurse potential all the way down to potassium's nurse potential, right? So we go from plus 30 all the way down to like minus 90. So that's the action potential from one location. Well, what happens to this area of membrane then? Well, it has to repolarize, right? It has to get back up to its baseline of minus 70. So at number four, what's happening, all the channels are closed. So the further change in membrane potential is due to the sodium potassium pump, right? Putting things back, pumping sodium out and potassium in. Okay, can you uh, hit my lights for me? Because we have, I hope, a movie. This Hopefully this is going to run. Yes, woof. Neurons send signals over long distances by generating and propagating action potentials. Did I stop it? No. Most action potentials originate near the axon hillock of the cell body in the initial segment of the axon. It then travels the entire length of the axon. A closer look reveals that during an action potential, voltage-gated channels open and close, altering the permeability of the plasma membrane to sodium and potassium ions. A threshold stimulus changes the shape of the voltage-gated sodium channels, causing their activation gates to open. This event marks the beginning of phase one of the action potential, known as depolarization. As sodium ions diffuse into the axon, the membrane potential becomes less negative. This causes more voltage-gated sodium channels to open, and the membrane potential soars to plus 30 millivolts. At this point, two key events occur. The inactivation gates of voltage-gated sodium channels close and voltage-gated potassium channels open. These two events mark the beginning of phase two of the action potential known as repolarization. As potassium ions diffuse out of the axon, the membrane potential becomes negative again. However, the membrane potential continues in the negative direction, going beyond the resting state of minus 70 millivolts. This marks the beginning of phase three of the action potential, known as hyperpolarization. During this phase, voltage-gated potassium channels close and all voltage-gated sodium channels are released from inactivation. By the end of this phase, ions move through leak channels only and the membrane potential returns to the resting state of minus 70 millivolts. <laughs>
The neuron is now ready to fire another action potential. Summary. Generation of an action potential. A threshold stimulus opens voltage-gated sodium channels. Sodium ions diffuse into the axon, depolarizing it to plus 30 millivolts. Voltage-gated sodium channels close, and voltage-gated potassium channels open. Potassium ions diffuse out of the axon, repolarizing it to a negative value. The membrane potential briefly hyperpolarizes. Voltage-gated potassium channels close, and the membrane returns to the resting state of minus 70 millivolts. All right, so that's kind of a summary in video form. All right, hit my lights for me. Yes, sir. So is the delay, is that due to the different levels at which like it would, so like... The delay in uh, the activation gate opening and closing, like in potassium. So like, just say on the sodium, for example, so it opened, like, uh, is it the closed state? Is that just because it's slower, or is it because it activates at a higher... Rate? No, it's, intri it's intrinsic to the channel itself. So uh, a big enough change in membrane potential causes the activation gate to open and starts the closure of the inactivation gate. It's just really slow. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so to understand how the action potential moves in a real cell, we have to recognize the fact that cells are 3D structures, right? Um, so what we're looking at here is essentially part of the axon of a neuron. And you'll see that at rest, we got a lot of positive charges outside, a lot of negative charges inside. That fits what we know, right? We've been saying the resting potential is like minus 70 to minus 90. The sign tells you what the charge on the inside of the membrane is. So this makes sense with what we've talked about. Okay, so let's say we put a little neurotransmitter right here and there's a sodium, uh, let's say there's an acetylcholine gated sodium channel, for example. So we put a little acetylcholine in, that channel opens, we get some sodium that comes rushing in. So in that area, right, we have a change in membrane potential. We go from negative on the inside to positive on the inside. So let's say plus 30. Remember that the whole membrane of these ner nerve cells are full of those voltage-gated channels. So when we get a membrane potential change in one area, it ends up being conducted to other areas because the, when the membrane potential changes here, it opens those voltage-gated channels, which is allows more sodium to come in, see? So like in this example, we see propagation of the, the membrane potential change in both directions. Well, in an actual axon, this is not what we want, right? We want all of that to go in one direction so that we don't have signals going in two different directions at once. And we have a system for that, which we'll get to in a minute, okay? Um, <clears throat> but this is showing you how membrane potential change can propagate. All right, so we have two different kinds of uh, action potential propagation in our systems, in our human systems. One is continuous. Continuous is slow, all right, but it's also hugely ancient evolutionarily. Um, the other form is saltatory conduction or, or myelinated conduction, right, which is very fast, but only evolved much, much later. <clears throat> so the oldest parts of our nervous system have this kind of propagation. So to give you an example of this fast versus slow routine, everybody has stubbed their toe, right? Well, when you stub your toe, you, you have a very quick sensation of what has happened, right? And then what happens? Like half a second or a second later, you start to feel the ouch right? Well, the delay is because the pain is coming through continuous propagation. It's slower. The I stubbed my toe signal, in other words, the fast touch, 
um, uh, signal is coming through saltatory conduction, myelinated conduction. So it gets to the brain in a, in, you know, a fraction of a second, fraction of the time of this. But let's talk about continuous propagation first because it's easier to understand. All right, so here we are at the axon hillock, the initial segment. We've had enough graded potential, enough local potential um, from uh, receptor-gated channels to make a change in the membrane potential, right? Okay, so the, when the region of the axon hillock, known as the initial segment, when it reaches plus 30, or whatever its threshold is, all right, that plus 30 is going to trigger the, the full action potential. Okay, so how does that happen? Sodium comes rushing in. Well, the sodium does not stay put, all right? This is all open on the inside. So the sodium that came in here ends up drifting this way, right? So the sodium comes in here, moves over. As the sodium moves this way, it changes the membrane potential now in segment number two. It causes a depolarization of the second segment. So depolarizing the first segment causes the sodium to enter, which depolarizes the second segment, see? So now we get more sodium coming through segment number two. That sodium also doesn't stay put. It moves to the neighboring segment, does the same thing, right? So we're getting a continuous propagation of membrane potential change as sodium entering one area activates the adjacent area, which activates the adjacent area, and so on and so on, right? All right, so the other kind of conduction we have is called saltatory conduction. And here, instead of every little bit of membrane depolarizing like we have here, in this kind of conduction, each little bit of membrane has to depolarize and run through the whole system. That's slow. Well, in the myelinated conduction, we only depolarize the membrane at these spaces. Uh, okay, let's do a little anatomy. This is an axon. This is a myelin cell um, called a Schwann cell. The Schwann cell has a bunch of myelin, which is like insulation. It's like a, it's a lipid kind of insulation. And it essentially blocks the membrane and does not allow charge to leak through, okay? So uh, depolarization here, we get a bunch of sodium that rushes in here. It doesn't stay put though. It's gonna drift this way and depolarize this segment. That's gonna cause a bunch of sodium to come in here, which is gonna drift this way and activate the next node, do you see? So instead of having to activate each little bit of membrane, we get to skip a bunch of membrane and go to the next node, and then the next node, and so on. So it's much faster. The nodes, the areas of membrane that are active in between the myelin sheaths, we call them nodes of Ranvier, right? And you have to say it. If I could roll my R's, I would, but I can't. Nodes of Ranvier. Um, those are the areas of membrane <coughs> that depolarize in saltatory conduction. Um, <clears throat> so we go from minus 70 to minus 60. Remember, as we, as we move the membrane potential up towards zero, we activate those voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels, right? So as soon as the voltage-gated channels open, then we get the rush in of sodium, and here we are at plus 30 and then the same thing happens at the next area. So <clears throat> this dramatically speeds up the conduction of action potential from one part of the cell uh, down the axon to the other. Yes, sir? What is the myelin like composer that allows that charge to stay in the um, The myelin is, it's lipid-based, so it's heavily nonpolar which effectively blocks the movement of charged particles through that area of membrane. Um, <clears throat> so, and myelin is present in the central nervous system as well as in the peripheral nervous system. The, the system, the cells involved are a little bit different, but myelin always has a high lipid content and it, that blocks the transmission. The way I think of it is it's a little bit like insulation around a wire. You know, it's, 
by being non-conductive, it allows only um, the passage of charge, not the entry and exit of it. So this is called saltatory conduction. And that saltatory, that word means leaping, okay? So it, it leaps from one node to the next and therefore makes it much faster uh, in terms of conduction. Um, I can't really under or, or overstate how important myelinization is in how we live as human beings. There's a lot that we do that is really occurring at the millisecond level. You know, whether it's driving a car, catching a ball, playing sports, even writing, right? You know, we have to adjust our pencil angle very rapidly in order to actually be able to do that. So without this saltatory propagation system, we would just be totally different kind of organisms, you know? Now, um, I just do want to point out, we had a little chat uh, yesterday about not all human neurons are myelinated, okay? So we do have plenty of unmyelinated neurons that perform different tasks in the body. And when we get to our very brief nervous system uh, chapter in this class, we'll talk a little bit more about that, okay? All right, so saltatory conduction, and I got a movie. This isn't just about saltatory, this is propagation of the action potential in general. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Are all Schwann cells myelinated then? Schwann cells contain the myelin that wraps around the axons, right? So Schwann cells are the myelin. <laughs> um, they contain the myelin. And basically a Schwann cell is like a big flat cell that's wrapped itself around the axon. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Saltatory conduction is extremely fast, 
Velocities often exceed 100 meters per second. In contrast, continuous conduction is fairly slow. Velocities rarely exceed 2 meters per second. Nevertheless, both continuous and saltatory conduction propagate action potentials over varying distances because action potentials regenerate along the way. Summary. Propagation of an action potential. Once generated, the action potential propagates the entire length of the axon without decrement. Our button? Yeah. Brains are crazy things. That's what I was trying to do. Brains. I talk a lot about brains. You're going to find that out. Um, particularly my advisees. I, I apologize in advance. I'll talk about your brains. Okay. Recovery refractory period. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, what she mentioned this in the video, which is th there's this question of, well, why doesn't the action potential spread in both directions, right? If, if one area of membrane is able to activate the adjacent area of membrane, well, why doesn't it go in both directions? Well, the reason for that is what we call the recovery or the refractory period, okay? So there's two components to, that prevent the action potential from going the wrong way. One is that the sodium channels are inactivated. Remember, they have an activation gate and an inactivation gate. The inactivation gate is very slow to release. So after an action potential has occurred in a region of membrane, the sodium channels are blocked. They, no more sodium can come in. Okay, so that's part of it. The other part of it is the potassium channels are relatively slow to close. Well, potassium leaving the cell has a tendency to hyperpolarize the membrane. So we really have two forces that are preventing the upstream membrane from depolarizing again. One is a hyperpolarized membrane from potassium channels opening, and the other is sodium channels are blocked, so positive charge can't even get in, right? So both of those things make it so the only the downstream side of the axon is capable of depolarizing and then depolarizing the subsequent down, downstream side, okay? Now, <clears throat> so after the action potential, we have to still put the membrane potential back where it belongs, right? After an action potential, we end up hyperpolarized because of all the potassium that left, right? So that's the sodium potassium pump, um, which is a, 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 uh, uh, an actual pump in that it requires ATP to function, but it is a very efficient pump. So it very effectively moves sodium out and potassium back in. It is also self-regulating, all right? The sodium potassium pump works faster as the concentration of um, sodium inside the cell goes up, all right? And it's not a linear relationship. It's um, to the third power. So like if the concentration of sodium in the region of that pump is twice normal, the pump will work eight times as fast to evict that sodium, all right? So the uh, recovery period, which is generated by the sodium potassium pump, is relatively quick, but it is nonetheless a, limit a limiting factor on how quickly an action potential can be generated again. And that matters because remember, our neurons, they either send a signal or they don't. So the way that we transmit analog information, in other words, more or less, is through frequency. So how quickly a neuron can generate an action potential does matter. And one of the limitations on that is the sodium potassium pump, okay? Um, we already talked about the inactivation gate and that the inactivation of the sodium channel and the slow closure of the potassium channel create what's called the refractory period or that um, inability to generate another action potential until things have been put back um, to normal. Loading up. Yeah.
All right, here we go. A change to the membrane shape triggers an increase in sodium conduction. What does that do, or what is that? Eight eight one eight four zero two. Here it is down in the corner. Eight eight one eight four zero two. Ho ho. Okay. So this we talked about this at the beginning of yesterday. A graded potential is not an action potential. Okay. A graded potential or a local potential is a change in membrane potential, but it only happens in a region, a small part of the cell. You have to have enough of these graded potentials or local potentials to generate an action potential in the first place. All right. So remember that our neurons are heavily interconnected. So in order for one neuron to have an action potential, it needs to be stimulated typically by multiple other neurons, right? In order to bring that cell to what we call its threshold. The threshold is the membrane potential at the axon hillock that will generate an action potential. Or another way to think of it is it's the potential at which the uh, voltage gated sodium channels open, right? Because that's what you need to have to make exciting stuff happen. A uh, acetylcholine, for example, will open a channel and it will cause a membrane potential change. But if it doesn't bring that cell to threshold, we will not get an action potential. If it doesn't get the membrane to the, to the voltage that opens the voltage-gated sodium channels, nothing happens. Okay, so change to membrane shape, increase in sodium conductance, that's the beginning of a graded potential, local potential. Okay, next one. What causes a neighboring region of membrane to depolarize in an action potential? The neighboring region. Yeah, voltage gated sodium channels, very good. So the voltage gating is the key to action potential generation. In other words, a small membrane potential change makes a big membrane potential change happen. That's why we called it a positive feedback mechanism. Um, <coughs> uh, Voltage-gated potassium channels are important, but they are in the repolarization or hyperpolarization phase. Depolarization, remember, has a specific meaning direction upward, up towards the positive. What causes that? Influx of sodium from the sodium channels. Oh, did I cover my button? Yep. All right, next one, last one for today. What it, why is saltatory conduction faster? Glad to see the little delay there at the beginning when you were reading all the answers. <laughs> Good. This is, in fact, in all of these. So saltatory conduction is faster because less things have to happen, right? So we have less membrane involved, fewer channels involved, and only charge has to move. Charge can move really fast, as we've all seen in our computers, tablets, cell phones, whatever, right? That's how they work. Well, same here. Charge can move very rapidly. So saltatory conduction, very fast, 100 meters per second. All right, let's see who won that one. The podium. Funny hair. 2502. Oh, no, that's the score. <laughs> Good. Nicely done, Focus Bobcat. Okay. Onward. 